Half a century ago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn published the Gulag Archipelago, bringing the world's attention to the Soviet Union's internment camps. Now that the camps are gone, now that the Soviet Union is gone, how bad was the Gulag, really? Professor Sergei Khan of Dartmouth College addresses that question. Uncommon knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born in the Soviet Union just a few months after the death of Stalin, Sergei Khan came to the United States in 1974 at the age of 21. He received his undergraduate degree from Boston University and his doctorate in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Noted for his field work with the Tlingit people, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Got it. The Tlingit people of Alaska. Dr. Khan is a member of the faculty here at Dartmouth College, where we're shooting today, where he teaches courses on the native peoples of Alaska, on the Jewish diaspora, and on Russia. Next year, the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Gulag Archipelago, Dr. Khan will teach a course titled Red Terror, the History and Culture of the Stalin Labor Camps. Dr. Khan has been kind enough to give me an advanced copy of his syllabus. So what you're about to witness is a seminar between a masterful professor and a very slow student. Sergei Khan, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. I'm quoting from bits and pieces of the works that you cite in your syllabus. So okay. this is, I've done my reading and I'm, I'm coming to office hours with you, okay. Sergei. All right. Well, I hope you pass the test. <laughs> All right. This is from Gulag, one of the basic books that you place in your syllabus by Ann Applebaum. The word Gulag is an acronym for the Russian for main camp administration, but over time the word Gulag also has come to signify the system of Soviet slave labor itself, a vast network of labor camps that were once scattered across the Soviet Union. From 1929, when the Gulag began its major expansion until 1953, when Stalin died, some 18 million people passed through the system. Another 6 million were sent into exile, deported to the Kazakh deserts or the Siberian forests, and they too were forced laborers. Why does it still matter? It matters, first of all, because, you know, the, it's a cliche, but if, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. We, we need to know what happened. Um, it's besides the Nazi Holocaust of the Jews and, and some other groups of people, it's the worst crime of the 20th century. Um, horrendous, uh, destruction of human life. And yet, um, as I point out in the syllabus, um, my feeling is that while the Gulag, certain aspects of the Gulag is addressed in courses in Russian literature, Russian history, we don't have a standalone course. I couldn't find one. Yet we've had over my 30 some years at Dartmouth teaching here, we've had dozen courses on the Nazi Holocaust. There is a kind of almost a preoccupation, and for good reasons, we don't want to forget that Holocaust with, with that event. But um, there seems to be less interest in, in the Stalin's crimes. So that's the first answer. Mm -hmm. The second answer is uh, I did not anticipate when I developed the course last summer that Putin was going to invade Ukraine. I see your Ukraine, your flag yeah, I, on your lapel. I'm a big supporter of Ukrainian people. Uh, my wife was born in Ukraine. We're both Jewish, but we have roots there and ties. I'm from Moscow, but nonetheless, um, not only has this war presented to us a very dark picture of Russian government and particularly its leader, there's also, and there's tremendous violence, and we can talk about it briefly maybe, but um, there are aspects of this war that strongly remind me of the Nazi war against um, the Allies in World War II. But there's also, as I'm sure you know, 
uh, this war has been accompanied, preceded by gradual um, elimination of those few freedoms that Russia still enjoyed under Mr. Putin. And then, of course, with the declaration of war, the country has gone completely um, radical as far as persecution of war opponents of the war. Uh, we haven't seen yet any sentences based on this new law, but it's on the books. By simply calling this a war rather than a special operation, you could go to jail for 15 years. This is unprecedented. So I would argue, and I don't think I'm alone, that the country which in 1991 rejected communism, and we were all celebrating it, um, which tore down the statue of Dzerzhinsky, the head of the, the founder of the KGB. We were ecstatic when we saw that on TV. The country has gone almost completely full circle. And in some ways, there are certain things that is government doing today that are even more vicious than late Soviet. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to. But that what I'm saying is um, there's a de-Stalinization going on. All right. And I just had one more thing I wanted to say. When, when you say that uh, the gulag is done, in fact, there are new gulags or some old gulags that are still running. In Russia? Yeah. The number of prisoners is smaller, much smaller than under Stalin or even Brezhnev. But people have been sent to the camps for political reasons. Mm. Uh, Navalny, the, uh, you know. Putin's the, opponent. Yeah, he's there for on trumped up charges. So in some ways. It's still going on. Uh, yeah, no, not of course on that massive scale, but, but it's there. All right, Sergey, let's go. I wanna come back to contemporary Russia and what it means for us, but let's just establish what the Gulag was. Mm -hmm. Again, from Anne Applebaum's book, Gulag. Lenin reckoned the Bolshevik revolution takes place in 1917. Mm -hmm. Lenin stages a coup in effect. Mm -hmm. and takes power. Lenin reckoned that the creation of the Soviet state would give rise to a new kind of criminal, the class enemy. From the earliest days, in other words, people were sentenced not for what they had done, but for who they were. By 1921, there were already 84 camps in 43 provinces, close quote. The gulag did not arise because communism somehow went wrong. It was there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Absolutely. Vladimir Lenin dies in 24. By 1929, Joseph Stalin, his successor, has consolidated power. He becomes dictator. And he puts the gulag prisoners to work. Mm -hmm. And you have a note in your syllabus about the importance of the White Sea Canal. I've looked this up. It's 140 miles. Mm -hmm. Construction begins in 1931. The canal opens in 1933. It connects the White Sea in the Arctic Ocean with, with the Baltic. Labor force of 125,000 prisoners, and at least 25,000 died during the project. What does Stalin think he's doing? What do ordinary Russians hear about this? How can this happen? I think that there are sort of two, uh, two sides to this story or to my answer. I think initially, and you're absolutely right, the arrests and persecution of people after the Bolshevik coup um, centered on not so much on what they did against the government, although there were people who fought the government, the white army officers. Right. There's a civil war in so forth, yeah. yeah. Right. But um, selecting the enemies by social, economic, or sometimes even ethnic categories. So uh, even if a person himself or herself didn't do anything illegal or anti-Soviet, the fact that they were from the family of merchants or nobility, um, they were already a suspect. And so that um, made it possible to, uh, to, send, to be sent there. However, um, in the early years, of uh, Gulag, particularly Solovki, which I mentioned in my syllabus. And Solovki is the name of yeah, a it's, camp it's, a, or... yeah, it's actually an old Russian Orthodox monastery in northern Russia. It's a beautiful place. But they, since they shut down the monastery, they already had 
a building or actually a large compound with a wall. And they use that to house prisoners. Um, and the initial idea was that criminals, anti-Soviet elements, as they were called, would be rehabilitated. And in fact, they were called um, labor-correctional camps. I mean, we use the word correctional institutions as right, well in, right. in, in the West. And so there were some elements of trying to rehabilitate them. Uh, Salafki, compared to later camps, did have some uh, venues for cultural activities, and um, it published its own newspaper. Anyway, the idea was that there's also a lot of cruelty, wasn't it? Well, what, by, by rehabilitate, is this, are we talking about a re-education? Re-education, change in ideology, rejection of previous views. And the idea was, at least for propaganda purposes, and I think initially even for some practical purposes, that these people could be redeemed. Now, Salafki also, you know, they had their own theater, but they also had horrible um, places for torturing people. And I mean, they already had, um, I mean, just give you one example. Um, if you were um, a difficult inmate and they just couldn't deal with you, uh, they could take you to the forest, tie you to a tree naked, and then have the mosquitoes, which are in abundance. This is above the Arctic Circle, yeah, or close yeah, to it. Yeah, close, but awful. Or they would put women stripped naked and, and force them to sit on, on an ant hill, and the ant would crawl into their bodies. You can imagine how. And it was awful. But there was still this element that maybe some of these people could be redeemed. And um, when delegations of Soviet writers come they're present to the camp, they're presented with this Potemkin village, as we call them, where they have theater, they're making a movie, uh, they're athletic competitions, and these either naive or simply people who are writing what they're told to write, but they write these uh, descriptions of highly enthusiastic accounts of this wonderful camp. Including Maxim Gorky. Yes. A major, and also major of, of, of Bellamore Canal as well. Um, and they make a point that unlike bourgeois capitalist uh, prisons and camps, ours are different because we will rehabilitate people. But I think eventually they kind of dropped the rehabilitation part, or at least lowered the importance of that, whereas they realized that they have free labor. The, the, this canal, it's a huge, as you said, there's 140 many, miles. Yeah. They actually um, had, as far as my reading of, of the story of the canal, they didn't have a lot of machinery. A lot of the digging of the earth was done just by bare hands. And so these poor people had to work under incredibly difficult conditions. And uh, the irony, of course, is that eventually canal turned out to be too shallow. So today, very few ships can go through it. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was hailed as an achievement of the Soviet mm -hmm. system. Um, it wasn't just Stalin. There were some very clever administrators of these camps, some of them former inmates who were promoted because they were so smart and uh, were good with numbers and so forth, or organizers. They figured out that you can get a lot of things done. You can mine gold, you can mine uranium, which of course is a dangerous, um, contagious Radioactive. substance. Radioactive. Um, you can mine coal, you can build roads. Uh, the Gulag system at its height, which I think would be um, 1940s, uh, was a major part of Soviet economy. And if you take Siberia in the north, probably the major part of the economy. Mm. To continue here with the... the Although Soviet there are other reasons that why they existed, I think, besides free labor, uh, like terrorizing the population. For well, that's... So again, to go back to your syllabus, you've got the collectivization, you've got, uh, and uh, Anne Applebaum's Gulag again. At the heart of Stalin's revolution is a new program of hysterically rapid industrialization mm -hmm. and also collectivization, where millions of peasants are forced to give up their land holdings 
and forced onto collective farms. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people resist both of these. Off they go into the gulag. We get the great purge or the great terror in the 30s where Stalin is purging the party. Mm -hmm. The West is aware of show trials, but as these show trials, which involve a small number of prominent people Tough take people. place, mm -hmm. there are huge numbers of people being purged and a lot of them end up in the gulag. Here's a question. During the 1930s, when this is taking place, Stalin is now consolidated power. The agricultural collectivization is accompanied by a, a famine. There's some debate about the extent to which the famine is engineered or the extent to which the government simply permits it to happen. But mm. one way or the other, the government is clearly complicit. And then we have Western journalists, including Walter Durante of the New York mm. Times, Sidney and Beatrice Webb in England, the socialist, great socialist figures, and they write about the Soviet Union as this gleaming new future on the one hand. Then we have a few figures. George Orwell, as far as I'm aware, never visits the Soviet Union, but he understands, somehow he understands what's but going on. But he met the Soviets in Spain during the Civil yes, War. Yes, of course, he encountered the communists in Spain. And Malcolm Mugridge, British journalist, visits Moscow and writes the truth. How, how, how is it that Westerners have these double, this kind of double perception and one is a total fantasy, or maybe not a total fantasy, there is industrialization, there is, they do dig a canal, these, they, they do use this forced labor to dig mines, there is some kind of economic output, but it's forced labor, it's inhuman. And a very small number of people see it and a very large number of people don't see it, refuse to see it. How do you account for these dub, this double perception? Complicated question. Um, based on what I've read or, or stories I've heard, um, it's probably a combination of things. For some Westerners, particularly of the more liberal left persuasion, I think they wanted to believe. Um, of course- They saw it, what they wanted yeah, to see. The West was going through the depression and there were problems, economic, social, and, and others. And so Soviet Russia, for many of these people, was um, a kind of beacon of, of light and justice and, and an alternative model. There was some fascination with this socialist project. Um, so that's- Which to a certain extent is sort of honest, understandable. You can understand the impulse. Yeah, that... yeah. All right. But I also think that um, some were gullible. Um, they, I think Durante uh, spent most of his time in Moscow with a lot of partying and, and, and you know, having a good time, drinking. And I don't know, he, I don't know if he made an effort to, to see the- To do reporting. And, and the earlier version of the KGB, the NKVD, they probably made it difficult to travel. But as you point out correctly, a few brave souls and smart people did see the the deception, the, the truth behind the um, the facade um, of that enthusiasm. So I think a combination of wanting to believe, believing, being cynical, uh, being lazy and not doing the homework, uh, or being afraid that if I really do investigative journalism, I could get in trouble. Um, and of course, the media itself, um, for example, the two leading journals for, for sort of American intellectuals, the, the Nation and uh, the New Republic, they were pro-Soviet. Mm. They eventually began to criticize the trials, but they, they were pretty soft on, on Stalin. And what I've read, uh, they would say things like, yeah, maybe the the big show trials are too much. Maybe some of it is uh, fabricated, but there must be something wrong. It, mm. it can't be that it's all invented. That's just not That's not possible. Mm. So you know, if your employer and I and I probably New York Times as well was uh, at least mildly pro-Soviet, um, and so when you um, your own employer back home wants to 
to have that kind of uh, reporting, you probably comply unless mm. you, you are a rebel or a brave person. Mm. The Second World War. Hitler invades the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941. The very same day, the prisoners, prisoners convicted of, quote, betrayal of the motherland are forbidden from leaving the gulag. In other words, their sentences, the very same day, Moscow decides that the sentences become indefinite. Mm -hmm. Nobody's getting out. And Applebaum again in Gulag. The result of these extended sentences, coupled with massive food shortages, were dramatic. Mm -hmm. Close quote. In 1942, one in four prisoners in the Gulag died. 24% of a population of about 2 million died in one year. Mm -hmm. The following year, 1943, another one in five dies. It's just a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Death wards scattered across the country. All right. After the Russians invaded Ukraine, one of President Zelensky's first moves in Ukraine, which he made reluctantly, but he gave a speech saying, I, we have no choice, was to open the prisons. Because whatever these criminals had done, mm -hmm. he trusted that more rather than fewer were going to fight for the country. Yes. Why didn't Stalin do the same with the Gulag? Now, I must say, eventually some prisoners were allowed to enlist. Uh, first of all, you know, you probably know that in the late 30s, during this, the height of Stalin's trials um, and the mass terror, the entire top layer of the Soviet Red Army Marshals, generals, wiped out. colonel, wiped out, arrested, accused of spying, many of them killed. Some survived and were sitting in Gulag. And so when, you know, the initial months of World War, of German invasion were a disaster for the Soviets. They were running. They were losing people and so forth, surrendering. Um, some of these top people were released, a few. We have example, including some that eventually became the heroes of World War II. That's a small group. Um, and then, and I don't know all the details. I'm still doing some reading. Um, I think there were some opportunities to enlist. There was this phenomenon in the Soviet army, which was called the um, penalty battalions. It's, it's a military detachment of people who were former prisoners or people who cannot be fully trusted. And they were basically destined to die first. You send them to the most dangerous engagements with the enemy. Uh, they're sort of like the, the stormtroopers, except um, they have, their arms are not as good. Um, nobody cares if they die. There's a famous anecdote after the war where Eisenhower is talking to Zhukov and they're comparing techniques. And Eisenhower says, how do you handle minefields? And Zhukov says, oh, we just march soldiers straight across them. Right. Unthinkable right. to Eisenhower's so, shock. So some Gulag prisoners, as I understand, were enlisted into these battalions. Right. But nonetheless, um, and it's ironic and it's not logical that the country that was really not doing well for the first year and a half and stretched to the limits as far as its human power, its finances, right, its industry, and where citizens were strongly encouraged, even pressured to donate gold and money to the war effort. Every single thing you had, you could donate or should donate. And yet the government was spending a lot of their resources on keeping these people Locked up. Locked. And I want to go back to something I said. When we say that Gulag was favored by the regime because of free labor, but it's debated, and the literature I've read is divided on this, but while you're getting free labor, you're also, first of all, you're treating these inmates very poorly. So they're hungry. They're barely moving. They're not your robust right. builders of you know, new factories and stuff. So you're not getting a lot of bang for your buck, if you wish. And secondly, there's some new work that I find really fascinating that claims that, in fact, 
uh, while the Soviet gulag camps were not the equivalent of Hitler's death camps. Uh, a lot of deaths did occur. Physicians, some physicians were complicit because they were not supposed to write in the uh, death certificate that the person died of starvation or abuse. Uh, they invented some diseases. Also, there was a, a method that one of uh, American historians points out that I just learned about, where prisoners who were really, really sick, malnourished, very close to dying, they were released. So to keep that, them off the books. Yeah, that way the numbers for people who died were much lower than the reality. So, so you're describing a system that is mad, yeah, that is insane. Yes. That even if you, if you, Stalin, you, you yeah. say, all right, he was brutal, but at least he built canals. Right. At least he, but actually it doesn't yeah. even make economic sense. Yeah. I, I'm not saying they didn't contribute to the, they built some new cities in Siberia and roads and stuff, but I think if these were well-paid, free volunteer laborers, they would have done much better. All right. The apex which takes place, again, I'm quoting Anne Applebaum. You have a number of sources. For some reason, I... I, I well, she's very good. She's very good, there's no doubt. Contrary to popular assumption, the gulag did not cease growing in the 1930s, but rather continued to expand throughout the Second World War and the 1940s, reaching its apex in the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. Reaching its apex in the early 1950s. What do we know about the early 1950s? Stalin has consolidated power totally. He's crushed all his enemies at home, killed a lot of them in the purges. With the United States and the United Kingdom, he's crushed Hitler. He is unchallenged in the Soviet Union. And he still keeps throwing people into the gulag. What, I guess the question here, Sari, is are we studying something we would abhor, but that's rational, that's an instrument of control, or do we see in Stalin in the final few years of his life someone who has really simply gone mad? I think a little bit of both. Ah. Um, first of all, I think once the system is in place, it's like a machine, it's running, and you have to feed it uh, fuel. In this case, you have to provide people, because you have a, a, a giant- you have an investment to protect. Yeah, you have, it's an archipelago, as Solzhenitsyn said. It's a giant, it's a country within a country, and um, there are hundreds of thousands of people employed to run it. Guards, supervisors, um, soldiers, um, cooks, Bureaucrat. I mean, there's so many people that are actually benefiting. You know, they, they're getting good. They, they were fed well. They had good warm clothing. They had decent salaries, particularly as you go up in the hierarchy. People at the top, I'm sure, who are running the gulag were interested in having more bodies brought in. So that's part of it. So it's a self-perpetuating bureaucracy yes. like the Department yes. of Motor Vehicles. Yes. But secondly, keep in mind that what happened right before uh, the World War II and after. In 1939, Hitler Stalin signed a treaty. Molotov a right? Yeah. Hitler occupies Poland, most of Poland. Stalin occupies um, Eastern Poland, which becomes Ukraine, Western Ukraine, Western Belarus. Uh, he occupies the three Baltic republics, Moldova and all the suspect people, again, those who belong to the social classes that are not kosher, if you wish, uh, intelligentsia, businessmen, um, clergy, former military. They're, From they're, those countries. Yeah. So the high-ranking Poles, yeah. the Estonians, the Lithuanians, into the camps with them. Some go to exile and they live, uh, there are two systems. There's the camp and then there's people living in exile. Internal exile. Internal exile right. in very difficult conditions, but they're not in the camp. But a lot of these people are sent there. Then, of course, you have German prisoners of war 
We're talking millions right. of people. Right. Japanese prisoners of war, who very few people know about, uh, who I think were treated even worse than uh, German prisoners of war. And then you have resistors. There were real resistors, uh, such as Ukrainian forest brothers and Estonian forest brothers, who actually fought the KGB um, during the war, but also after the war. There were um, the Ukrainian uh, partisan army uh, finally was crushed only in the fifties. So for ten so years, still at it. Still the, at it. the Red Army and the KGB are hunting for these guys in the mountains of Western Ukraine. So uh, it's an interesting development because it's it's a different kind of population, and actually. Uh, what we have in memoir literature is that these, especially national, Polish, Ukrainian, Estonian uh, inmates, they were better organized. They knew that they were there for a reason and they hated the system. Unlike, you know, former Bolsheviks who ended up in Gulag and said, why am I here? I'm innocent. Comrade Stalin doesn't know about me. I'm sure I'm innocent. These guys knew why they were there. So. They're an interesting. And they were, did that, do, do we know that they, were they able to, was their survival rate higher? I think they were organized, they helped each other. I see. And then also, I mean, we think of the 30s of the wars, but the 40s and early 50s, there were still a lot of people being arrested who were innocent, mm. just mm. ordinary, or, it, or if they were guilty, they were things like, you know, after the war, there was this sense that we won the war, we beat Hitler. Maybe there'll be more freedom in our country. And you have this really interesting development of youth, underground youth organizations, often very small, but they're kind of true communists. They want a country that is really based on Lenin, not on Stalin. And, and these high school kids, they gather and they talk about how unjust the Soviet system is. So Stalin had his hands full is what you're saying, even when he appears to be at the peak of his power? Oh, and the collaborators, the people who collaborated with the Nazis. Okay. Which often become guards in the camp. Is that so? <laughs> he uses them, yeah. Because these are often people who, they don't really have strong values. They, they, they weren't collaborators because they believe in fascism. They wanted to survive. They wanted to be on the winning yeah, side. Yeah. All right, the end. Stalin dies March 5th, 1953. A few months later, you were born. He dies in 1953. And then, this I, totally shocking. The person who takes power first is Lavrent, Lavrenti Beria. Beria. And Beria is a very, very nasty figure. He rises through the secret police. Also smart. But he's a killer. And he's the one who very quickly ends most of the big forced labor projects mm -hmm. that are then taking place. He grants wide amnesties, all pregnant women, all women with young children, all prisoners under the age of 18, all prisoners with sentences of five years or less, and forbids the, the police from using physical force. So he, he, he grants a wide amnesty. He effectively abolishes torture. Nikita Khrushchev and the rest of the Politburo think he's getting uppity. They have him arrested. Barry is eventually executed. Mm -hmm. And Nikita Khrushchev comes out on top. But he doesn't repeal any of Beria's reforms. Mm -hmm. The gulag is over. Not completely over. But the number of prisoners drops to the tens of thousands from the, couple of, from the low Correct. millions. What on earth is going on there? Do we know why Beria, this very nasty figure, is the one who, if Beria grants the amnesty and Khrushchev in effect ratifies it, it looks as though all of Stalin's henchmen know that the system is crazy and they can't wait for him to die mm -hmm. to end it. Is that correct? Is that a fair interpretation? Beria is a mysterious character. While he was definitely nasty and, and vicious, um, and also, you know, there are all these stories about him abducting young women on the streets of Moscow and raping them and then sending them home. But he's also very smart, and there seems to be new research and archival work that suggests that he actually wanted to kind of tone down the, the viciousness of the regime. That 
I think he, he was beginning to see, as did Khrushchev, that the system is, is self-destructive, that if we don't stop it, first of all, it will destroy us, the, the leadership, and that it's just not working anymore. And maybe even he realized that the cost of um, running it um, outweighs the results, what they produce. So maybe he saw that, that it was a kind of a dead end thing and, and he wanted to. So where Stalin is beginning to become just crazy, where there's yeah, a madness yeah, in the system, yeah. Beria is at least rational. Right. Is that fair? Yeah. Right. A couple of last questions. After the war, Germany undergoes denazification. Mm -hmm. Nazis, people who had served the Nazis up at a certain level, are forbidden from participating mm -hmm. in public life. You can't hold office if you were a, a Nazi of a certain rank right. or higher. Right. And we know that Germany has spent all these decades putting distance between itself and that past, payments to Israel. In all kinds of ways, Germany to this day, just despises its own Nazi past. Russia never undergoes any kind of decommunization. If it had, Vladimir Putin, who's a former KGB, this is known, he was a colonel in the KGB, right, he was a right. KGB officer, he's now running the country. Poll after poll indicates that Stalin is still revered in mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, I just, who am I to write off a whole country? But it feels as though, unless there's some sort of formal repudiation of this decades-long crime of the gulag Absolutely. against against over 20 million people, there's a kind of sickness in Russia. Is that fair? I completely agree. When we were watching from this country um, how um, they were getting rid of Soviet symbols. They were now Russia as opposed to Soviet Union. We were hoping that, and then Yeltsin briefly actually outlawed the Communist Party. Yes. And we thought that was a good idea because it was a, a nasty institution. He even uh, organized the trial of the Communist Party, but that kind of petered out and mm -hmm. nothing happened. And they were very reluctant to admit complicity. There were attempts to, to shame people, for example, some writers who voted against the other writers and were responsible for the persecution of those writers. Um, they were exposed, but they said, it's not my fault, it was dangerous, you know, I was protecting myself. Um, none of the people who worked in the KGB system, unless they were, you know, vicious murderers, some of them probably were arrested, but the majority either retired quietly or went on to and, work. So, yeah, the the kind of denazification, decommunization that did occur, as I understand, in the Czech Republic, in the Baltics, in Poland, Russia never had. And in fact, in the last decade, there's a partial reversion. Rever it's kind of complicated that. Putin authorized the building of a monument to the victims of Stalin, but at the same time, um, you know, Stalin Lenin. won the war. He was a great, uh, he was a great manager. Lenin's embalmed corpse yeah, is still right yeah, there on Red Square yeah. in a place of and, honor. And they, uh, you, periodically we get these glimpses of destalinization. For example, um, they were celebrating the anniversary of the atomic project or some major scientific project that Russian scientists um, created in, in the 50s or 40s. Most of them were, were prisoners, so that's another interesting. A lot of top-level physicists were prisoners, but Beria was the supervisor of that giant project. It's sort of like the Manhattan Project. Right, right. And they wanted to, to honor him, build a statue for him at, in that capacity. And um, I saw letters from children and grandchildren of these great scientists, who many of them later became you know, Nobel Prize winners, right. academics. And they're begging the government not to do it, that it would be a sacrilege. Mm -hmm. But the government does. Mm -hmm. um, or there are now celebrations in some northern Russian cities that were built by Gulag inmates. There are celebrations of the Gulag administration who helped 
create a particular Unforced labor. town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sergey, last question. Here's you in an interview in the Dartmouth Review, quote, I look at the free speech movement in this country in the mm -hmm. 60s. Those people were fighting for the right to say anything they wanted. Now a significant segment of the left in this country is fighting for restricting those freedoms. What really frightens me is when you hear students and some faculty say that they don't want freedom of speech in this country, that they don't need it anymore. That really frightens me, mm -hmm. close quote. You don't mean to suggest that anything like what took place in the Soviet Union could happen here. Uh, I don't, although there are Russian immigrants, including some very close to me, who think that we're going in that direction. I personally... Have you seen anything in this country where you say, ah, this reminds me of something I'd rather not Political remember. correctness, uh, students afraid to speak their mind because they'll be branded, you know, conservative or right-wing or racist or whatever. Um, a kind of hounding people for, you know, on campus before they've even been tried in, in the court of law. Um, presumption of innocence doesn't seem to be present. Um, but I, I must say, I believe in America. I love the country. I think there's a healthy core that will still carry us through. But I think we, we are hitting some rough bumps and, and it is disappointing. It is scary. Mm. Yeah. Professor Sergei Khan, who next year will be teaching some very fortunate Dartmouth students about the Gulag. Thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and filming today on the campus of Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, I'm Peter Robinson.